Good morning to all of you, and I'm pleased to present to you uh, my paper on nature-based solutions and climate change. Uh, let me now try to share my screen here. Okay, so my topic is nature-based solutions for climate uh, resilience. And just recently, I'm sure a lot of you, if not all of you, have heard that the IPCC released its sixth assessment report and the world's media covered uh, those events, a warning that delay means death. We're running out of ways to adapt to the climate crisis. And therefore, it is important for us to understand what are the implications of this report uh, to us in the Philippines, especially for the topic of our uh, conference uh, this morning. And so what I'm going to do is first uh, present uh, just the key highlights of the second working group uh, report and the third working group report of the IPCC and try to uh, discuss the implications of this, especially for the most, most vulnerable as well as to our indigenous peoples. Let me start with uh, the working group two report. And the key message of this report is that there is now cumulative evidence and it is now unequivocal. In other words, there, there is no more uh, uncertainty. There is always uncertainty, but uh, scientifically speaking, it's almost uh, unanimous that climate change is a threat to both human well-being as well as to our natural systems. At the same time, the report says that we need concerted global action to take advantage of this window of opportunity. It is fast closing and we have to act right now. Now, let me uh, share with you some of the findings related to uh, indigenous peoples uh, and the poor, uh, the most uh, vulnerable uh, sectors of our society. The report says in terms of food production and access to food, that the sudden losses in, in both of these have increased malnutrition, and especially for indigenous peoples, small-scale food producers, and low-income households. So again, the poorest of the poor, the most vulnerable, including indigenous peoples, are now suffering from uh, a malnutrition as a result of uh, a warming planet. Now, the report also says that biodiversity is at risk. On the left panel there, you will see what will happen to uh, our biodiversity resources at 1.5 degrees centigrade. And you will recall that the Paris Agreement is targeting 1.5 or even up to 2 degrees centigrade of warming, no more than uh, these warming levels. And the warmer the planet, uh, you will notice, the more biodiversity loss will happen. Uh, so the redder the color, the higher percentage of biodiversity will be lost. And so why do I show this slide? Well, it is because loss of these ecosystems or the biodiversity uh, in these ecosystems and their services has cascading and long-term impacts on people. And again, the report says, especially for indigenous peoples, local communities, who are directly dependent on ecosystems for their basic needs. So again, the report of the IPCC highlighting the impacts on our most vulnerable peoples, including indigenous peoples. Now the report also called for, therefore, for adaptation. We need to adapt right now. And why is that relevant to our topic this morning? Well, first, if we adapt now, there will be positive uh, impacts or benefits to SDG. These are the Sustainable Development Goals. Number one, no poverty. Right now, three and a half billion people in rural areas stand to benefit from improved roads, reliable energy, clean water, as well as in food security. Well, SDG three is good health and well-being, uh, mainly in cities. Uh, and again, a lot of our poor uh, uh, communities are located in urban areas, and they too could benefit uh, from such adaptation measures. Reduce inequality, again, very important. 
right now are uh, poorest of the poor, uh, our indigenous peoples uh, do not have or cannot access, do not have uh, equitable access to uh, resources, and they too can benefit. And well, uh, SDG 14 and 15 are more for ecosystems. And as we have seen, a lot of our uh, poorest communities depend on ecosystems for their nutrition and livelihoods. Now, the other point I want to make is related to what is known as maladaptation. And uh, we can say that this is simply misguided adaptation, adaptation that leads to negative uh, impacts. And uh, the report also, this is uh, C.4.3, by the way, this, uh, this code here is uh, where you will find this in the report, uh, in the summary for policymakers uh, of the working group to report. And the report says that maladaptation especially affects marginalized and vulnerable groups. Uh, and again, citing indigenous peoples, ethnic minorities, low income households, informal settlements, reinforcing and entrenching existing inequ inequities. So again, we see here that again and again, the report highlights the, uh, the impacts of climate change and even uh, misguided adaptation uh, that could negatively impact uh, these uh, groups of people. Now, uh, and lastly, the report also uh, really pushed for what is known as climate resilient development, CRD. Uh, the report says we have two options, uh, a warmer planet that is on the lower uh, right, or a more benign, um, less uh, warm planet, uh, one, not more than 1.5 or 2 degrees centigrade, and such is, of course, our ambition. But the reality is we're headed towards a warmer planet right now. And again, related to our topic, uh, the report uh, mentions that safeguarding biodiversity and ecosystems is fundamental to attaining CRD or climate resilient development. So very important. Uh, this is what is known as nature-based solutions. Uh, relying on our ecosystems, natural ecosystems, to help us adapt to a warming climate. And CRD, climate resilient development, is facilitated by developing partnerships with traditionally marginalized groups. And again, citing women, youth, and indigenous peoples, local communities, and ethnic minorities. So the report, uh, IPCC report, recognizes the great importance of uh, knowing the impacts of uh, climate change on indigenous peoples and the marginalized groups and uh, helping them adapt to a warming planet. Now, let me move on to the third working group report, uh, which is on mitigation uh, of climate change. And the third working group report this time uh, showed the continuously rising levels of greenhouse gases. Uh, this is not totally new. Uh, it's been uh, going on, ongoing for the last, uh, well, since the 1800s, uh, mid 1800s, but especially in the last uh, 50 years, we have seen the dramatic rise of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. And uh, a lot of these are still coming from fossil fuels, uh, about 80% and about 20% coming from uh, land use change, uh, deforestation, as well as uh, agriculture. And you just see here uh, the different continents or regions of the world and which is the dominant uh, source of uh, greenhouse gases in those regions. In our part of the world, it's still uh, land use change, uh, more than fossil fuels, uh, but uh, uh, of course, that's because of Indonesia and a lot of deforestation happening in that country. And but, but then we must also realize that there's mitigation potential coming from agriculture, forestry, and land use change. An example of this is, for example, uh, ecosystem restoration, afforestation, and reforestation. When we maintain forests and we establish new forests, there is uh, sequestration or absorption of carbon uh, from the atmosphere. And I want also to highlight that these uh, mitigation options, and there are so many of them in the report, I just called out uh, one uh, related to nature-based solutions. And uh, the important thing, again, to note is that ecosystem restoration, reforestation, afforestation, 
they have positive impacts as well in terms of the SDG. Very uh, predominantly positive. There's one negative here, but it's predominantly positive. In other words, if we pursue these mitigation options, they will also help us attain sustainable development. Now, uh, so that's really my uh, sort of uh, quick summary of the IPCC reports relevant to our topic. But now moving on to nature-based solutions, and especially uh, for the Philippines and what's happening right now in our country. Uh, nature-based solutions uh, here in this uh, figure here simply shows that they can work throughout the whole transect or uh, from upland to lowland or ridge to reef is sometimes uh, you know what we call it uh, from the uplands or the mountains all the way to the coastal to, to the uh, rural areas to cities and all the way to the coastal and marine zones there are many uh, adaptation related to um, or many nature-based uh, adaptation or solutions and let me just cite some examples here uh, from our country uh, one study showed uh, by the this is from the bureau of uh, uh, biodiversity management bureau showing that our ecosystems and biodiversity have a value equivalent to two trillion pesos and you will see here that uh, carbon offset or climate mitigation, 453 billion pesos worth, flood pr prevention, 41 billion, water provision, 50 uh, billion, and, and so on. So here we see that these uh, natural systems uh, provide uh, many services that can be quantified and, uh, and, and thus we appreciate them uh, more. Uh, natural forests uh, store huge amounts of carbon and uh, they, they function as well in absorbing uh, carbon as they grow. On the flip side, when we cut trees, then we also emit carbon to the atmosphere. When we plant trees, then we increase carbon stocks, and this is what is known as carbon sequestration. Now, trees also help farmers become more resilient to changing climate. For example, trees enhance uh, coping capacity to uh, small holders, especially to climate risks. And how, how? First, through crop and income diversification. So they have more sources of income and they don't rely only on one crop. Uh, soil and water conservation, trees and woody perennials function to conserve soil and water in, in, in the watersheds. And also uh, they lead to more efficient nutrient cycling and nutrient conservation. And, and therefore uh, the farm the farms uh, remain productive over a longer per period of time. Now, we know that forests also uh, help uh, stabilize water supply, whether for domestic, irrigation, industry, and hydropower. Uh, we studied the, the, the top programs of the DNR and look at how climate change uh, may affect these programs. And uh, to give you just one example uh, of uh, uh, forest, uh, you will notice from from this uh, uh, figure here, one of their or one or two of their programs are enhanced national greening program, forest protection number two, and number three is uh, biodiversity conservation. Now th those three programs could lead to more stable water flows. This is adaptation, color blue, provision of goods and services, uh, biodiversity protection, and increased income and livelihoods. And in terms of uh, benefits uh, for mitigation, carbon stocks, conservation, increasing carbon sequestration, and therefore reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Now, there's another study uh, commissioned by the World Bank, by uh, Losada et al. At, and in this study, they show that uh, uh, mangroves, our current mangrove forest, if they were totally lost or totally uh, cut or deforested, 24% more people will, would be flooded annually. In other words, more than half a million uh, people uh, will be flooded. Uh, this is additional to what uh, are or to who are or people who are currently uh, experiencing flooding. And the damages to property would increase by about 30%, more than $1 billion annually, and more than 760 kilometers of roads would be flooded again if these mangroves 
uh, were cut and lost. And they also estimate that one hectare of mangrove can provide more than $3,000 per year of direct flood reduction benefits. So again, the point here is that if we keep these mangroves, we are able to uh, uh, protect our uh, people, uh, our infrastructure, and, and uh, therefore, in a sense, avoid all of these damages uh, where those mangroves uh, where uh, those mangroves uh, to be uh, cut or lost. And we know that our forests have been uh, vanishing in the last 100 years. Now, of course, right now we are slowly recovering with the aggressive uh, national greening program of the government, but we lost 50%, half of our forests in the last 100 years. And uh, again, I'm glad that uh, we are slowly uh, getting them back. Uh, and of course, we need to support uh, such uh, programs uh, of the government and even of the private sector. Uh, so the government is embarking on the national greening program and uh, I think this is being continued and, and will be continued by the current administration. And not only the government, but even the private sector is actively involved in, uh, in greening. And this is an example uh, by the Energy Development Corporation uh, called Binhi. And they have planted thousands of hectares and right now they're focusing on native trees conserving protecting our native uh, forest species now our center the oscar m lopez center uh, is also uh, emphasizing the need for science-based information as we adapt to climate change so here's an example of one of our products and uh, i have been citing the ipcc the intergovernmental panel on climate change which releases its uh, major assessment reports every five to seven years. And so what we did was also to uh, have our own IPCC-like assessment of scientific literature. And we call it the CCA, the Philippine Climate Change Assessment Reports. And we, uh, we started the first round in 2016 for Working Group 1, Working Group 2, 2017, 2018, and the mitigation uh, was uh, released in 2018. And uh, right now we're in the second cycle, the second assessment report. And, uh, you know, these reports, what they do, just like the IPCC, is that our top scientists uh, review all the relevant scientific literature out there and try to synthesize them so that they're more understandable, more understandable, more accessible to our policymakers and to other users. Because we believe that uh, we need science-based information if we are to be climate resilient, if we are to adapt to uh, changing climate, and again, especially for our most vulnerable, uh, low-income groups, the indigenous uh, people's uh, uh, groups. And finally, our center uh, also realizes that it's not just science, or it's not, it's not just producing information, but we need to realize or we need to communicate this uh, message. Our message needs to be communicated to a wider audi audience out there. And we have been, um, well, experimenting and uh, going into uh, films, for example, short films, uh, docu-films, so that we can reach a wider uh, audience and communicate the need to adapt uh, to uh, climate uh, change. And so with this, I hope I have given you enough information and just to wrap this up, my take home messages are two points. First, natural ecosystems are critical in enhancing climate resilience of our people, especially our IPs and other vulnerable groups. And lastly, we must, we must therefore support efforts to conserve and manage wisely our natural resources. And so with this, I end my talk. Thank you so much for listening. And again, good morning to all of you.